Well, good morning. Good morning. So we're in week two of living free. And you know, this, uh, this few days ago, I turned 57. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, a 30-year-old man in a 57-year-old body. I just don't understand that. So how does that happen, right? You feel young until your feet hit the floor in the morning, right? It's like, oh, man, I know I'm still alive because I'm still hurting, right? Yeah, you get it. Well, you know, in these 57 years of life, I've been a believer for over 30 years of that. Amen. And can I tell you what I thought I knew at the beginning, I didn't really know because it was theory, but now it's practical. And so I want to take a minute this morning to share with you something that many of us miss in our Christian life. And I really feel like that so many believers are living a life that Christ did not design for you. It's something that you created yourself. And the life that you're living, I can promise you this, as a Christian, you don't enjoy it. You're not fulfilled by it. You feel like there's something missing. And you would be exactly right. There is something missing because you're living a life that you created that God didn't design you for. And I lived that life for many years thinking that it was what you were supposed to do but not realizing that what had happened is, is that our spiritual enemy had deceived me and robbed me of something that God really wanted me to have. And so, if you could just listen this moment in this morning and let God allow this to soak into your heart and mind, it will change the way you live your Christian life forever. You won't be dreading God anymore or dreading the things that you have or sitting there mentally working yourself over in your head because you're not good enough, which you're not, in your mind. Because there's a ploy out by the enemy, and God warns us about it in Galatians 5.1 that we started off with last week. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. So Christ has truly, I love the, the, the emphasis there, it's not that Christ might set us free, it's not that I think he set us free, it's not what anybody else says, that God has truly, 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 truly set you free, whether you believe it or not, he has truly set you free, now make sure you stay free. That's the part that we miss. That's the part that the deception comes in. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law is what Paul tells us here as God is inspiring him to write this. And so he's helping us to understand the context that he's writing to these people. And we're going to sort of step into that context because God's word, even though it's written to a church, it's timeless through eternity. Because it's God's word. Not because I make it something, it is what it is. And so he's telling them, he says, listen, there's a dangerous thing that's going on that's trying to take your freedom away. And that freedom, I want you to understand something about it, that there's this pathway that you can take that pulls you away from what God wants you to have. And I really believe there's a set of Christians over here and a set of Christians over here, and this has nothing to do with being lost. It has everything to do with your freedom. And we're walking down this pathway, and we all think we're going towards God, which we are, but one is very, very laborious, and one is so free. The question is, which pathway do you want to travel? 
So Paul says, listen, in verse 2. I tell you this, if you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit. Now, I'm not sure that part is timeless. I don't think anybody, any, anybody in here is thinking that circumcision is going to make you right with God, right? But in that day, we'll explain what it was. He says, I'll say it again, if you're trying to find favor with God, so now he's expounding on it to help us understand what's deeper than just the act of circumcision. Find favor with God with being circumcised. You must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses, which that's a lot. And so what Paul is trying to get us and them to understand is that there's this pathway where they have become followers of Christ. And as they're following with Christ, then they're trying to add to that so that they physically, they mentally can engage in religious activity to push them down the road spiritually so that they're hoping to find favor with God. So they're, they're working at that. And it's so subtle because in our minds and in their minds, we'll start living this life that God has given given us and all of a sudden we switch lanes and we get over here where you and I think that it is my effort that makes me more favorable to God. It looks something like this. Oh, I didn't pray this morning. I'm not going to have a good day. Oh, I didn't go to church this week. I'm not going to have a good week. Oh, I didn't read my Bible today. This is not going to be good. And what you're saying is, is that my activity steps me into the favor of God. That what I do depends on whether I stay in God's favor or not in God's favor. And for them, it was this outward act of circumcision. That circumcision was a sign of the covenant. And so if you didn't do it, you weren't right with God. So it was this activity that they had. It didn't do anything to you spiritually. It was a physical activity. Not a very pleasant one at that, right? And so in this quest of theirs, they began to pick up rules and regulations so that their relationship with God was not based on a relationship. Their relationship with God was simply based on the, the things that they did. And so instead of focusing on Jesus, they were focusing on the particulars of, of, of hey, you've got to be circumcised. Hey, you can't eat on a certain, at a certain time. Hey, you can't walk so long on the Sabbath. Hey, you, and so all these things that began to surround them themselves with. Why? Because they felt like they could control their destiny now. But the problem was, is he tells us here that they thought by doing this that they could make themselves righteous. Or in right standing. So, so, so here's the struggle. That they were trying to make themselves righteous when they were already righteous. They were trying to get somewhere that they already were there. And so this is the lie, this is the deception for us as believers is that when you are saved by grace, you are saved by grace and the full righteousness of God cloaks you so that you are wearing the robe of Jesus' righteousness, not any righteousness that you created, it's only his righteousness. And so now that we have the robe on, we live our lives looking for the robe that we already have on. I need to get better. God, I, I'm so, we're thinking that God is looking at us as these people that are so worthless, so sorry, because we still make mistakes. We can't keep our life together. And so we're on this quest to find God's righteousness for us. And we're looking so hard that we don't realize that 
We already have it. The other day I was getting ready to go somewhere. And you know, it's sunny. And years ago I had LASIK surgery, so the sun's a little, still a little bright to me. I can't just, it, it affects your eyes. I guess you can see better. I don't know. Well, I know I can see better. You see the sun differently. And so I'm looking around for my sunglasses. I'm like, where are my sunglasses, you know? And, and so you, you, you blame it on whoever's at home. Honey, what would you do with my sunglasses? They're on your head. <laughs> oh, yeah. Spiritually, we're running around looking for this, this different life, this righteousness. And, and, and we're like, God, you just change me. God, change me. And we're looking, and guys, you already got it. Why are you looking for what I've already given you? Just put it on. Just learn to walk in the lane that I established you in when you were saved and stop going back to that lane where you're trying to make yourself what you could never make yourself before you knew me. You understand that, right? Why do we, now that we're believers, think that we can finish the work that only Jesus can start and the Bible says that he is the author and the finisher and you're not even writing the book. You're in it. You've just been invited into the story, but we are trying to take over the story. Like, God, hey, i got to help you here, God. Yeah, I know you did that little thing like create the earth. I know you did that little thing like create the universe. I know you put all those stars up there, God. But you know what, God? I feel like you might not be able to handle changing me. So I am going to step in, God, and save today. And I use a non-biblical term to describe this when we do this. We screw it up. We just mess up the whole thing. Now what we've done is we've actually invited God out because now by our own effort, we are going to become righteous. And here's the thing is, you are frustrated. You wonder why you can't change. It's because you haven't been walking the way that God designed you to walk. And you stepped over here in this lane where you now think that it's all by my own effort and I don't even enjoy my Christian life. So how can I just keep pressing into something I don't even enjoy? You're going to quit. And then you're going to blame it on God. God didn't change my life. No, you didn't change your life. You couldn't do it before. You can't do it now. And so he's telling them this to try to get them to understand it. And it continues. In verse 4, if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen from God's grace. If you keep on doing what? Trying, trying, trying to make yourself right, to look righteous before God, then you, listen, you have been cut off from Christ. What does this mean? This is what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you lost your salvation. This is one time where Going to the Greek word and looking to see what it means actually helps you understand what the Bible is talking around. You see, when you say cut off and use this word in the Greek language, it means not subject to privilege. So you have lost your privilege in Christ. You haven't lost Christ. Christ hasn't lost you. You've actually relinquished your privilege. You remember growing up, uh, older folks here, when your parents put you on restriction? You lost some privileges, didn't you? 
And so you were restricted. And that's what this word means. You have fallen. You've, you've sort of stepped outside of what God put you in. You haven't lost your salvation. You have just lost the privileges that God gave you. What are the privileges? It's the freedom that we have in Christ. It's the freedom that we have in grace. It's the power that we have in grace. So you are saved by grace. He wants you to walk in grace. He doesn't want you to give up those privileges. And he says, listen, you've been cut off from those privileges, that freedom. So if you want to be righteous before God by keeping his standards in your own effort, then you're losing the very power, the power that he gave you to be saved by. And you've, he uses this term, you've, you've fallen from grace. What is grace? Grace is you are saved by grace, that not of yourself. So grace is God's unmerited favor that he's given you. Grace is this freedom that he's given you to break free from the old life by receiving Jesus Christ. You didn't do that because you created it yourself. You did it because God lavished his grace on you. And so you got this redeeming grace where God saves you, but you also have sustaining grace where God sustains you. Why? Because grace says that God does it because you can't. It's his favor. And so he's saying, listen, you have fallen from God's privileged favor. And so what does that mean? He says when we step into this area of our lives where we as believers begin to think that, you know what, it is up to me to change myself, then we fall from God's privileged favor of grace. And now we've stepped into a works mentality, and you and I will work ourselves to death, and we'll never become more righteous or holy. And here's the thing, if you don't become more righteous, then your life will look similar to what it looked like before you were saved. And you, friends, will think you're lost because you're not living in grace, you're living in your power. And we ask ourselves, why well, can't I overcome this habit? Why are you focused on that habit? Because you want to do something to change it. So what are you going to do? You're going to focus on it. And guess what? It's just going to become more pronounced in your life because now you've thought that by the mental gymnastics that you create in your head that you will adjust your life and this habit will be gone. It doesn't work that way. If you are saved by grace, then you continue to walk in grace. And what does grace do? Grace doesn't look at my imperfections. Grace keeps its eyes on the one that's perfect so that my imperfections fade away because I have my eyes on the one who's perfect. But we want to help, don't we? Sometimes we think that it's easier to work hard to be a Christian than just to enjoy Jesus and be a Christian. Sometimes we, we feel like we've got to earn something that God's already given us and we don't have to earn. It's just given to us. So when you got saved as a unbeliever you got saved that's a term we use in church and saved means that you've been pulled out of that old life you've been rescued from it because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that he died for your sins so that he could eradicate them and that he rose from the grave so that you would have life and he conquered your fear of death So in him, he's done this great work, but in us, we circumvent that work because we pull all this old way of thinking, all this old action back in to try to help God change me. So I want you to listen carefully if I describe this next piece for us. So many of us as Christians 
or living your life the way that I live my life. We use the Word of God as something to achieve instead of something that Jesus will achieve in me. When you read the Word of God, it's, I got to be that. You cannot be this because this Word is Jesus. This is his character. This is his person. This is his holiness. And so you got to go to the author of the book to become the book. You understand what I'm saying? Don't think that you, this is your list. This is who he is. It's him. It's the word of when the word became flesh. What word? The logos. It was incarnated. It's Jesus here on earth. It's God himself. And he's saying he's living this perfect life. Why? Because he's showing us who we will be in him. But for me... Instead of realizing that, I got way down with a life where I used the word of God to critique my behavior. And you know what that did for me? It just made me feel guilty all the time. I, I, I got it. I can't measure up. God, I'm not good enough. God, well, and so I, I'm telling you, when I first became a believer, I can't tell you how many times I come home at night. I kneel down beside my bed. God, I don't think it worked. Save me again. God, I'm just, I'm just not, I don't feel saved, God. I mean, how can a saved person still think the thoughts that I think? How can a saved person still look at what I look at? How can a saved person, hey, God, save me again next night. God, I need, I need another dose because I, I must not have got all of it. I'm just being real with you right here because I know that many of you are walking down that same pathway. You have those same thoughts. When I preach a sermon on being saved, you think, I'm not sure I'm saved. And you're why are you not sure? Because you're looking at your behavior, right? You're saying, you know what? I just, but, 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 but Jesus, what did you do? And so I was in this, this place where guilt, now there's a difference between guilt and conviction. Conviction moves you out of a state because God's power is with it. Guilt leaves you in a state because the enemy is condemning you. You hear me? So if you got guilt going on in your life, you'll always have guilt until you allow God to release you from that guilt. Because the accuser of the brethren is accusing you. God wants to release us through the power of his righteousness in us. And so I was living this way down life. And so my whole Christian life was a life of self-examination. Now, he says to examine yourself to be where, see whether you're in the faith. He doesn't say once you're in the faith, just keep examining and examining and examining yourself. And I'll keep writing everything down. And so here I was. I was so overwhelmed because I wasn't doing this. 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 And when I read the Bible, I'd see I'd find more stuff I wasn't doing. And so, oh, there's, my list just keep getting longer. I said, man, how can I even be saved? I can't even do part of this. You know what I'm talking about? You been me, church? can I tell you there was never a time during that period that I said I was glad I was saved because I just wasn't sure and the passages here that describe that describe me had fallen from grace in other words I had stepped outside of the privilege of grace that God had put me in and here's the thing that I didn't realize that I want you to understand is that rules that seem to have power from an outward appearance have no power to change your heart. You see, what, what we do and what I was doing is that, you know, I looked at people and I thought, well, that's what you're supposed to be, right? That's what Christians do. And so that's what I'm going to do. And so what I did is I just sort of stepped ahead of God and said, God, you know what, uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and tackle this, this sin issue over here because you seem to be working too slow. I need to get rid of this. And guess what? It might go for a few days as long as I focused on it, but then it came back. 
Because there was no power in it. It was, it was me. It was my own effort. I can't make it religious. I can't baptize it and make it right because there's nothing right about it. It was just simply my efforts. And my efforts never created holiness. My effort never created righteousness. It just created a frustrated, guilty Christian. And it wasn't fun at all. Many of you know what I'm talking about. That's why so many people. When did you get saved? Well, which time are you talking about? I got saved at vacation Bible school. I got saved when I really knew what I was doing. And I got saved again when I really really, really knew what I was doing. And you know what? Every time you just feel like you're not saved, you just raise your hand and you want to get baptized again, you're going to have to have, we're going to have to put a plaque on the pool over here for you because that's your pool. And you listen. I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm saying that because I get it. I understand the source of where you're coming from. You're in the wrong lane. You're in the lane where you feel like you got to get to the end of the road, that you're the one by your effort that's going to produce it. When God is saying, you listen, I saved you by grace. So walk in grace, rest in grace, enjoy grace, enjoy what I'm going to do in you. And so here's the thing is, when we look at our lives and we start doing this self-examining stuff, there's something missing because what I'm doing is I'm looking at my effort rather than God's effort. And so, so God is trying to break us free from that so that we get to a different level. And in Galatians 5, 5, he, he, he steps us into this, the, the freeing truth that we need to grab a hold of because if we're going to fight for our freedom, we need to know what we're doing. It says, but he who lives by the Spirit eagerly waits to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. He who lives by the Spirit, Christ in me, the hope of glory, the Spirit in me, the Holy Spirit lives in me. If you are a believer this morning and you're sitting in this room or you're online, just raise your hand. Say, I'm a believer. Just raise your hand. You say, why am I doing that? Because you're falling asleep. <laughs> no. I want you to know who you are. You just raise your hand and said, I am a believer. And so if you are a believer... The Holy Spirit is in you. Whether you feel like it, whether you act like it, He is in you if you place your faith in Jesus Christ. So now you have the power of God residing in you. Do you realize that? When you leave this room, then you have the power of God residing in you. When you got up this morning and said, I'm going to go to church, connect with God, you brought God with you when you came in this building. When you go to work, God's going to be in the car with you. As crazy as you drive, when you flip off the person next to you, God's still in you. So how could God put up with that? Listen, he put up with a lot more before you got saved. But you're thinking, you know, but, but, you know, God, I let you down. You didn't let God. Who are you to think you could let God down? He knows how, how he knows our hearts. He knows the part that you hadn't even manifested yet. He knows you wanted to flip off the other guy, but you showed some restraints. <laughs> so in this quest... He says, listen, but we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive something. You see that? We who are believers are still waiting to receive the full righteousness that we already have. What is he talking about? He's, we're waiting for it to be manifested. 
You have not fully seen the full righteousness of God in your life. That's why you get ahead of God. But here's what Paul is saying. He says, we simply wait on the spirit to manifest it. We wait on God to manifest it. God has to do the work. If he doesn't do the work, then I am restless. If he does the work, then I can rest in the fact that where I am right now is where I need to be. You see, what the problem is, is that when we become Christ followers, we immediately think that we're supposed to be perfect in the manifestation of our righteousness. But God says that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what that means is that I'm not quite there yet, right? So my expectation is I'm saved and I'm perfect before everybody. I'm never going to sin again. No, no, God's going to grow you into that state. But you're not going to grow yourself into that state. You've got to wait eagerly on the Spirit to do it. He will transform you. He will change the way you think. And so my role is to simply walk in the Spirit and rest in the Spirit rather than getting ahead of God and trying to create this righteous life that I can't create. You say, well, Greg, do I do nothing? No. You just do one thing. The one thing that you do is you wait to receive by faith the changed life that God promised. And the one thing that you do, the other thing, on the other extreme, is you wait on the Holy Spirit and stop acting like you are the critiquer of the Holy Spirit in your life. If he hasn't changed it, he is not ready to change it. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with God not changing that right now? Because he is working on something else. But here's the fact. Just celebrate in the fact that you want it changed. That you realize there's something there. But release it to God and say, God, I know this is here. I know you know it's here. I know you don't like it, and I don't like it. I am going to wait eagerly for you to change this. When you say that, people just freak out because we control freaks. We're like, God, but people aren't going to think I'm a believer. God, people aren't going to think I'm holy. God, people, they already think that. We, we, we take the religious facade off and walk with the cloak of Jesus' righteousness. You will become as he is. You're transformed. And he tells us that we're going to be transformed into the image of Jesus. That means there's a process to getting there. That means that you you got a little Jesus in you. You got a lot of you in you too. We get frustrated and all we focus on is the you we got in us when we should spend more time focusing on the Jesus that we have in us. Because the Jesus is the victory. The other is the very thing that defeats us. Now just imagine. You're driving down the road. You have that moment where that person cuts you off in traffic. You give them the number one sign. And instead of feeling guilty, you just simply say, God, thank you that you're going to change that in me. Instead of sitting there feeling guilty, you begin to thank God for what you know he's going to change because you know you have the righteousness of Jesus in you. It's a different way of thinking. It is the Christian life. Listen, I promise you I can go around this room 
You're not the wife you want to be. You're not the husband you want to be. You're not the teenager you want to be. You're not the kid you want to be. You're not the grandparent you want to be. You're not the worker you want to be. You are not what you want to be. And all you do is you sit around and look at what you're not because what you want to be is not what you are and you want to change. And so you don't like your life. You don't like your life with Jesus. Sometimes you don't like your wife. You don't like your husband. And sometimes you don't like your kids. You just tolerate them and you're living this life and you're not even being real with yourself. Because we think that we have to look a certain way. Because we're religious now. When you got baptized, instead of getting baptized in Jesus, you got baptized in religion. And so while you're here, you act one way. When you're out there, you act a different way because that's who you really are out there. That's the person that really needs to be changed. That's the person that really needs to be transformed. That's the person that God's working on. And so be okay with the person that's out there because God's not finished with you yet. Amen? Now, I'm not saying love your sin. I am saying love God so much that you become like him and your sin fades away without focusing on it. So if we know that we're not perfect in practice, what we do, then why do we start analyzing myself so I can defeat my imperfections? Why do I live my whole Christian life looking at what I am not instead of looking at who I am? Why are you doing that to yourself? You are a believer you're going to heaven one day. You realize that? The ticket's already printed, sealed in the blood of Jesus. Amen? You, listen, you will become more like Jesus this year. You'll become more like Jesus next year, but you will not be Jesus this year, and you will not be Jesus next year, and you will not be Jesus the next year. So stop walking around like you are the next Savior of the world when Jesus just simply wants you to take one day at a time and love him on the journey that he's got you on. Listen, for when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, next verse, there's no benefit in being circumcised or uncircumcised. No benefit in trying to earn your way. What is important is faith expressing itself in what, church? Faith expressing itself. When I get up in the morning, God wakes me up. It's so I can express myself. If I am feeling like I'm not in that loving place, then all I simply have to do is tell Jesus what I'm struggling with. And not trying to analyze myself and figure everything out. Jesus is going to do all that. Just rest that I'm saved by grace. I'm going to get to heaven by grace. I'm going to change by grace. I'm going to change next year by grace. I'm going to change the next year. You realize that I've been a believer over 30 years and God is still changing me? Why? Because he's digging deeper and he's digging deeper. And so I don't have to walk around wondering what you think about me. And listen, I don't care what you think about me. I care what he thinks about me. And let me tell you what he thinks about me. He says that I am the apple of his eye. He says I'm loved eternally. He says that I'll never be separated from him. He's saying that I can't even comprehend the love that he has me. It's too high. It's too wide. It's too deep, Greg, for you to even walk in this pool. But I'm going to let you have a little bit more of it every day so you'll be able to love me differently. That's what I want you to do, Greg. I just want you to love me because I love you, and I'm even going to give you the energy to love me. Woo! And I can't believe that God, God let me step on that bus and ride it all the way to heaven. And he drives. He's not the co-pilot. He is the pilot. 
Amen. Do you know what I do? I just enjoy my Christian life. I don't sit around anymore and wonder what God needs to change. I just walk my life with the desire to keep my eyes more on Jesus and love Jesus in a deeper way. And if I get off focus and I begin to look at my behavior, I'm usually looking at my behavior because it's been substituted for my pursuit of Jesus. See, when I'm in the Word and I'm just walking and loving on Jesus, I ain't thinking about my behavior. I'm thinking about Jesus. When you get out of the Word, you get out of your practices that feed that love, then your default is to look at your behavior because now you think that's what's going to make you holy because you're not using what will make you holy. So I want to ask you this morning. Have you given up your freedom? Have you fallen from grace? Not lost. I'm not talking about lost. As a believer, have you fallen from grace? Do you, are you more frustrated with your Christian life? Why would you be frustrated with the life that Jesus gave you? Because you have tried to do something to manipulate it. That's why you're frustrated. Would you, would you release that to him this morning? And say, God, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to allow you any longer to be co-pilot, God, in this story. And God, I'm going to stop trying to achieve righteousness. And God, I just want to, for a season, just walk in it. Realize I already have it. And church, I'm going to let you off the hook this morning. Stop judging the people around you by what you see. When God's not finished with what you see. <laughs> yeah. Let's just encourage one another. Spur you on in your faith. You are the full righteousness of Jesus. And when he sees you, he sees himself. When the father sees you, he sees his son. And so rest in that. Walk in that freedom. I don't have to examine my life anymore. I'm just going to chase after Jesus. I'm just going to chase after Jesus. I'm just going to chase after Jesus. And when I get tired of chasing, I'm going to say, Jesus, help me to chase you some more. And I'm, I'm not going to beat myself. I'm not going to beat anybody. I'm giving everybody a beat-up break, all right? You're not going to get beat up this week for me. Hey, maybe you can give your spouse that break because they're not, as, they're not as, as, as close to Jesus as you are, you think. Maybe they're not as religious as you are. But only God knows what's in here. Only God knows what he's working on. And guess what? God doesn't need your help to work on them. Let him change them. I promise you, he'll do a whole lot better job. Because you just want what you want. God wants holiness. So would you bow your heads for just a moment? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you just tell God right now, God, I want to be free again. God, I want to step back into grace. Jesus, show me how to love you. Jesus, show me how to fall deeply in love with you. God, not with religious activity, not with check boxes, God, not with trying to look like something on the outside when the inside we're dying, God. Lord, this morning, Lord, we 
accept the full fact that we have the full righteous robe of Jesus around us. And God, we confess our sin of trying to change ourselves by our own effort, God. Lord, we want to be released back into your grace this morning so we fully enjoy this life that you saved us for, God, this life that you want us to have, that we walk in the full joy of Jesus this morning, the fullness of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. Thank you for that freedom. Thank you for that release, God. And for that person that's here this morning that totally missed the boat, that totally missed what it means to be a believer this morning, and it's fully understood this morning, that's what I really want, God. I want to be saved by grace, not by my ever, by grace, God. And Lord, if that person's online or watching in this room right now in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray they would embrace who you are, Jesus. They would embrace God this morning, the fact that you died on the cross for their sins, for, the, for their sins, for all of them, God. Lord, may they grasp that this morning, that you rose from the grave and put the final stamp on death. That no matter what their life looks like in you, that they are saved for all of eternity. God, I pray that that person would embrace that truth and tell you right now they want to be saved. Thank you, Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we have our invitation time and you stand to your feet. If you need us to pray over you, come let us pray. Or maybe you just need to come down to the altar and say, Jesus, I am coming back to grace. I've been walking on the road so long, I beat myself down, and this morning, Jesus, I am embracing my freedom again. Don't miss out on your opportunity to express what Jesus is doing in your life right now. If you need healing, let us pray over you to be healed. Let's respond to him.